in the name of God, our Creator, our Redeemer, and our Sustainer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Those of you who were here last week will remember that Father Joachim introduced us to Easter laughter. And I know some of you weren't here, a bit like Thomas, weren't here last week. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of Easter laughter just to start us off the seat this morning. The rabbi, the 61-year-old rabbi, went to his doctor to have a medical check. And the doctor gave him a complete check and said, you're in very, very good order, uh, very good blood values. Um, tell me, how old was your father when he died? And the rabbi looked at him and said, who said my father's dead? He's 83, he runs the local shop, works seven days a week. In fact, he's running the marathon next weekend. And the doctor said, that's amazing. How, how old then was his father when he died? And the rabbi looked at him and said, who said his father's dead? He's, he's 104. In fact, he's just announced he's getting married again. And the doctor looks at him and says, why would anyone want to get married at 104? And the rabbi looks at him and says, who says he wants to get married? His mother's making him. <laughs> so there's the Easter laughter that turns the darkness into light and into joy. But let me begin somewhere else. In Deuteronomy, Chapter 32, verse 11, you can look it up when you get home. Moses likens God to a mother eagle who teaches her young to fly by pushing them out of the nest. Now those who've studied the ways of the eagle tell us that she makes a wonderful, if rather unpredictable mother. The mother eagle builds her nest in the tall trees, taking the utmost care to line it with the softest feathers that she can find. When her eggs hatch and the little eaglets are born, she gives them her complete and undivided attention, bringing food every day to build up their strength. After several weeks of this tender, loving care, the mother eagle suddenly changes her behavior. She knows that it's time for her eaglets to leave the nest and learn how to fly. So reaching down into the nest, she rips out the feathers, she breaks up the twigs and overturns their nice, comfortable little home. The little eaglets, of course, are frightened out of their tiny wits. Gently, she nudges each of the birds in turn towards the edge of the overturned nest and pushes it into the air. The little bird, of course, falls like a bullet to the ground, squawking with fright. But just as it is about to hit the ground, the mother eagle swoops beneath it and catches it on her broad wings and carries it safely up into the sky. Then she tilts her wing again and the bird falls once again. But this time, as it flaps its wings in fright, it discovers that it can fly. I wonder if this is something of the experience of St. Thomas in today's Gospel reading. And indeed, I wonder if it's the experience of more and more people today. Is it that of all the disciples that we can relate best to Thomas? Because we too know what it is to doubt. We stand like him with doubts in our hearts. We want to believe. We feel we should be believe. But sometimes we just can't. In the late 1980s in Helsinki in Finland, the Lutheran Church began organizing evening services for people with doubts. They called them Thomas Masses. The first night, 700 people came. The movement has spread and there have been Thomas Masses held here in Berlin too. People have doubts. But especially today, 
long to believe, long for hope, long for trust, long for light. A few years ago, a small group of five men with doubts spent 40 days in a Benedictine monastery in England. One of the five, Tony Burke, wrote later about what happened to him. And what he wrote reads a little bit like a modern version of the story of St. Thomas. His story begins, God meant nothing to me. He was an old geezer with a beard in illustrated textbooks or in comedy sketches. He was a figure of fun and parody, like everything religious in the outside world. Religion is mocked and belittled for purposes of entertainment. And I spent many years working in the media, in advertising and in TV. So I've done my fair share of cynical mockery of everything the church stands for and those who choose to use what it has offered. God doesn't exist. God is for old people. Priests are running from life. Theologians are on a meal ticket attempting to answer unanswerable questions about the existence of God. And they're going to spin it out until they retire in Spain. So yes, I needed some convincing. Sure, monks are lovely, they love each other, they love God, they love everything. But if God doesn't exist, which I didn't think he did, then wasn't this whole monastery lark just a bit of a cop-out? That's what he wrote at the beginning. By the third week, as Tony spent time with the monks, joining in their way of life, he started to read the Bible for himself. And slowly, things began to change. He writes, I was accepting the possibility of the existence of God. I was going to church. I was reading the Bible. But nothing was happening. And I remember having this out with the abbot. And he told me that God would talk to me if I listened with my heart. Well, what the hell does that mean? But I was here in a monastery, and so I soldiered on with prayer and study, and I developed a one-sided conversation with God, and I became quite comfortable with that. And soon I started to feel things. Once I was having a bad day. I'd broken my foot running, and I was hobbling around on crutches, unable to move around freely. It was cold and wet, and I was surrounded by fields. I had nowhere to go. Then I sat on a bench and had a conversation with Father Ian about providence and how God works through coincidences. And my spirits began to lift. Later, I had a strange sensation in church, like the feeling of falling in love and the butterflies that go with that. As his time in the monastery drew to a close, he writes, Well, I've been in Worth Monastery for 38 days. I've learnt a lot. I've prayed a lot. It was a fantastic experience which I'd, fling myself, which I'd flung myself into passionately. All that was missing was the cherry on the top a faith which I could draw upon and say, I believe this whole God business, but that I couldn't claim. So with my suitcase virtually packed, we started preparing to leave. My attentions were turning towards my life back in London and my work. Then midday through my last conversation with my mentor, Brother Francis, I was hit by something that I'll never forget. It was like I'd taken a drug and I felt paralyzed, unable to speak. It lasted a whole minute. Francis blessed me and we went outside and I chain smoked a packet of cigarettes, deeply, deeply moved by what had just happened to me. And that was it. That was my call. That was my answer. It existed. 
there was something in it. It wasn't just grown-ups dressing up or something to do on a Sunday before the pubs open. I wasn't looking for it. I wasn't willing it to happen, nor was I expecting it to happen. But it did. It was real. And I felt that for the first time in my life. And without realizing it, I had worked very hard at making myself receptive to it, if there was anything there in the first place to be receptive to. I think I made myself spiritually open to offers. And I went home, away from Worth Monastery, with this gift. And it's a gift that I carry with me today. I explore it at my own pace, on my own terms, because I'm never going to carry a tambourine or wear a habit. But I was put in touch with a spirituality deep inside me, which has given me the energy and the inclination to strive for so much more in my life, to appreciate what's important, to be a better person, to want to lead a better life, to want to leave the world in a better place than I found it. My whole world view has changed. It's created its own problems. I know myself better. I know when I'm doing wrong, whereas before I was oblivious. So I have to forgive myself and accept myself, which I do by asking for forgiveness and acceptance from God. I don't go to church services. I go to church on my own, without anyone knowing, because I'm not yet at the point where I'm comfortable to hold aloft a flag emblazoned with the word Christian. But I think, personally, religion is a gradual and constantly developing process. And when I'm ready, if I become ready, then I'll move it up a gear at my own pace. This month in a monastery changed my life. God exists. My God exists anyway. And as Brother Francis said to me that night, never try and explain away the mystery of God. Let's keep a little silence together before the choir sings. <clears throat>